Coming up, I'm going to walk you through how to guarantee that you're being paid fairly. We'll break that down. And then AI is changing things so quickly. The story of a content writer who lost his gigs and how it might affect you. Let's go. This is the Ken Coleman Show, where we help you get unstuck so that you can make more money and experience more meaning in your work, the thing you spend more time at than anything else. All right, let's talk about something that is always supercharged emotionally. I mean, it just always is icky, yucky, awesome. Uh, It's just there's no in-between, and it's what you make. It's what you get paid. Deeply personal. And uh, boy, oh boy, is is it full of horror stories frustration, and more. So let's do a quick snapshot of what I see as a massive, massive problem as it relates to how our compensation is looked at. Do we have proper perspective on pay in America? There's the open-ended question. Uh, This would be a great poll. What do you think? What do you think? Do you think that by and large, we the people in America have proper perspective on what we should be paid? That's when, when This is when I need my Jeopardy music. I'm going to tell you, I don't think that we have proper perspective. And I think that it is uh, largely due to Uh, Some of our younger generations in the workforce, let me give you some real numbers so you don't think, well, Ken's being an old man and he's cranky today uh, because he got out on the wrong side of the bed. Well, let's just give it to you. Okay, snapshot. March 2023 survey of undergraduates. So so these are these are young people that are in college, many of which will walk the uh, the platform or already have, I guess. Now we're 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 into uh, good gracious. So the the year goes by so fast. It's going to be Thanksgiving before I know it. So we got a lot of kids graduating. Right. And so what do they think? What are their expectations about pay? Now, this is a warning to some of you folks who've been working a while. This is going to uh, unsettle you. How's that for a safe word? Here we go. <clears throat> Students expect to make $84,855 on average one year after graduation. $84,000. We have some adults in the lobby watching the show right now, and they are uh, very polite but but amused. That's 52% more than the average starting salary of $55,911. <laughs> so, so here's our first reality check. These students, oh, yeah, I want to make $84,000. let us round it up. I want to make $85,000 one year after graduation. 12 months, baby. Ramp me up. I want to be sniffing six figures. That's their expectation. When the reality is, um, the average starting salary for someone coming out of college is $55,000. Let's round it up, $56,000, okay? So now let's keep going. A decade into their careers, students anticipate making more than $204,000. So, great expectations. I, listen, and I'm all for great expectations if the great expectations are based on reality. More on that in a moment. Now, let's just juxtapose this number. The average uh, student want to make uh, a decade into their career, 200000 That's what they anticipate, by the way. By the way, The word anticipate is a key word here. It doesn't mean they hope for it. They're expecting it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 10 years. Oh, I'll make 200,000. 200K, 200 large. That's That's what they anticipate, Alex. Well, what's reality? The average mid career salary is $98,000, according to Glassdoor. So here's where we are, certainly with this younger generation. Okay, and by the way, I'm not picking on them, but this is, you come to this show uh, because you expect me to tell you the truth, 
and you expect a large amount of common sense. And so I got to keep it real. What's happening here is very simple. We have a generation of young people. By the way, these numbers, they reflect the kids that are in college now, but these numbers aren't off if you just go look at each Let's take the last five to seven years and the graduates of those classes, they had similar expectations. So all that means is we have an epidemic of unrealistic expectations in this country. Now, where does that go? I'll tell you. Almost every time. Almost, listen to me, almost every time. Unrealistic expectations lead to unmet expectations. That's what's happening. So they expect to make a hundred grand come out of school, and they're going to make fifty percent of that. So, so, so now the expectation isn't met. So, guess what happens? Frustration, and then eventually, desperation, because you're now having to deal with however realistic. It looks like we don't know, but you're dealing with a devastatingly different result. And so when you set your eyes on something that is so wildly impossible, and then you realize that it's impossible and it finally sets in, it's a very traumatic experience. And I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, Kumbaya on this, I'm, I'm telling you, no wonder we got a lot of unhappy young people at work. You've had this expectation, and you think that's what it's going to be, and you walk into reality, and it's just literally punching you in the face. So fair is not based on a feeling. Fair can never be based on a feeling. So how do you know? So that's the problem. We have unrealistic ex- expectations. And people aren't dealing with reality. So that's the problem. So we got to get off of what I feel and go, wait a second. Fair should not be based on feeling. Fair should be based on facts. So let's look at it. You, there are some clear signs if you're being underpaid. If a company's growing exponentially and other people around you uh, are getting raises and you're not, is that fair or unfair? I don't know. But you're being underpaid for a reason. Dig into it. No compensation increases on an annual basis. Healthy companies are giving basic annual raises. So now it leads to what do I got to do? I got to go get some knowledge. I got to look at salary.com just as I'm not endorsing that site, but that's one website, Glassdoor. And I look at salary ranges based on similar jobs with my skill and experience, and I get a ballpark. At least I'm dealing in reality now. I can see I got a range, and if I'm on the low end of the range, now I've got some sense of where I stand, also where I could go. And so it's no longer about fairness. It's about facts to go away second. If fairness enters the equation, it's only after I've got some facts. So then we go and we, we, and we, we could take this to our leader and go, hey, listen, I want to grow professionally and grow financially. So what can I do to grow? What's, what things do I need to improve upon? What new skills or tools can I add? And then you got to have some grit and patience. If they give you a plan, you got to go earn it. You just can't expect it. Do you know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, that's your talent, the work you love to do, that's your passion, and the results that matter to you, your mission. Then you'll feel more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash clarity. All right, folks, if this show is encouraging you, equipping you, and you can think of somebody, you know, I know somebody in my family or in my friend circle that could benefit from this. Uh, I would love for you to help us grow. And uh, you can do that if you're watching on YouTube uh, by liking the video that you're watching. 
and then share it with somebody. That helps us grow. And while you're at it, a subscribe would be awesome. Um, and then if you're listening via your favorite podcast app, give us a follow. That's the new metric. And uh, a five-star review. All those things help us grow. And in the podcast episode as well, you can just click share. Uh, and it's super simple. And drop it to somebody that you think needs to listen or watch this content. Because we want to encourage people. Because there is a, a world philosophy that work pretty much is going to suck. And you just have to grit and bear it. And it doesn't have to be that way. Life does not have to be lived that way. All right. Let's talk about things that are happening in the world of work that affect you. I am a man of the people because I try to keep you informed and uh, not scare you like most of the media tries to do. Uh, I like to provoke you. Uh, provoke uh, used properly is not angry. It is not offensive. It just means I like to push you a little bit into a place where you're forced to think. Oh, we need to think a lot more in our world today. And if we thought better, I got news for you, we would feel better. But we live in a feeling-based world. I feel this and I feel that. and You made me feel this way. Oh, my gosh. How about we think a little bit? Or how about if we have a feeling, we process the feeling and add some thought to it? All right. I'm not going to scare you. I'm going to inform you. Here we go. Um... Side note, I am now dipping my toes into, and I say toes, I'm not ankle deep yet, Alex, but I am dipping my toes into the chat GPT world uh, because it does fascinate me, and I am a content provider. So it is, you know, all these stories of how is it going to affect content providers, um, and, and I figure I want to mess around with it and play around with it. So we'll see. If I got anything worthy to share of my own experimentation, I'll share but this is very relevant to the story. This is from Fortune Magazine. The headline is, Chat GPT is terrifying. Um, it's terrifying, and it is adding subtext to the writer's strike that's going on in Hollywood. Now, I know most of you don't give a crap about... Um, let me turn my computer down here so we're not making noise. Uh, but most of you don't care about the writer's strike, and nor should you. Okay? Um but it has a lot of implications that I think is it's worth watching um, because ChatGPT is absolutely a tool that is going to be used in entertainment uh, across the board, books, screenplays, television shows. I mean, it's going to be very much used. It already is. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of unease in Hollywood, especially with writers. Um, currently, the Writers Guild of America is striking um, and it's all about better pay. But the AI issue is looming because on one hand, this union is taking a really strong stand, <laughs> and so they're striking. And then you got this threat that never existed before. And, and if you're unfamiliar with ChatGPT, just give you 30 seconds of context. It is a free software now with artificial intelligence. And think of, it is, it is, it is unbelievably in, effective in going out and aggregating and pulling content and spitting it back out. Okay. I've tested it. So the other day I was messing around with it. And I said, um, I said something to the effect of write me 1500 words on the challenges of leadership in the voice of, and I picked a comedian, which I'm not going to get into. Because I wanted to see what happened. Oh, man. I got 1,500 words like that in the voice of this comedian. And I chose a comedian that's very salty. And I wanted to see, like, does it sound like this comedian? It blew my mind, Alex. So this has never existed before. So let's go back into the story in the context of Hollywood. So they quote Danny Strong, um, who is... Uh, the creator of two shows, Dope Sick, which I've never heard of, and Empire, which I have heard of. And he said, this is his quote, AI, artificial intelligence, as it relates to creating content, is terrifying. He says, I've seen some of ChatGPT's writing. And as of now, I'm not terrified because it's a terrible writer. But who knows, that could change. So on one hand, he goes, it's terrifying. But right now, I'm not actually terrified because... 
the writing's not that good. I'll come back to that statement in a moment because it's really crucial. Uh, screenwriters are saying across the board, uh, there's no question that AI chatbots could be used to spit out a rough first draft, rough being the operating word based on my experience, uh, with a few simple prompts. Writers then could take what has been given to them and essentially become editors. And then they would be paid at a lower rate to essentially polish it up. Uh, the Writers Guild of America is obviously uh, active on this, and their president is a guy by the name of Michael Winship. And he said, we're not totally against AI. There are ways it can be useful, but too many people are using it against us and using it to create mediocrity. They're also in violation of copyright. And I think this is absolutely key. You've got some real copyright and plagiarism issues going on here. And so what I think, just as a guy who, who, who does write his books and who comes up with his content, and I, I write my talks, good or bad, um, I read, I write, I'm coming up with stuff every day. Today's show, I came up with it. Do I use a writer? Yes, for research and polishing up because I speak into a recorder. She spits it back to me. Folks, so, so I am admittedly here a purist. I believe in inspiration that comes from imagination. And uh, I don't respect people who don't create their own content, and yet they put themselves out there as a mouthpiece. I'm just going to tell you. I, I, I didn't say I don't respect their, um, them as a person, but, but you know, if someone is doing all your work for you and you are slapping your name on that content, I just got to tell you, as a guy who does it, I don't respect that. To me, that's an art form. It's not pure. That's all I'm saying. All right, enough of that. So the reality is, though, is I've messed around with it enough to go, all right, it can certainly formulate some ideas and angles, but it's not going to replace the human element, the human creative force behind what's really good content. No machine can do it. Can a machine borrow from other people's work? Yes, which is a form of plagiarism. So it's going to be very interesting to see how it affects script writers, uh, authors. It, it will be interesting in industries like movies and television. Okay, But let's look at Main Street. Let's get away from Hollywood and look at Main Street. Here's another story, Business Insider. Content writer says all of his clients replaced him with ChatGPT. His name is 34-year-old Eric Fine. He told the Washington Post that his largest client dropped him in March after it started using ChatGPT to write its content. Now, what type of content are we talking about here? Um, short blurbs for company websites, product descriptions, and marketing copy. So company XYZ hires a guy like this, and this happens all the time in America. And they go, we need you to write for this website, uh, product description, We've got a new product line. Give us something, you know, give us three or four paragraphs. Um, you know, give us 500 words. So give a short form, medium form, you know, maybe some long form uh, marketing campaigns. So uh, advertising agencies are employing writers like this all the time. So this is real. This is Main Street. This is not Hollywood. So he had nine contracts doing this kind of work. And all of them canceled because they were like, look, you're charging us $60 an hour. That's not bad. That's not bad. Okay? So if he's spending 10 hours uh, on a weekly load, they're saving real money there. So they started using ChatGPT. All of them have stayed with ChatGPT except for one. The one came back and said it didn't sound like a human. Well, there you go. So again, it's going to come down to quality. Humans will always beat AI when it comes to creative elements. Don't worry about it. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? You're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. If you need to make a move, you'll even get practical next steps to keep you moving forward. Listen, stuck is a choice, and life is too short not to do what you were created to do. To take the quiz, go to kencoleman.com slash quiz.
All right, folks, welcome back. In my never-ending quest to inform you, uh, we've got a very, very interesting and I think troubling trend over in Europe that I think is not very far from happening here in the United States. And uh, you need to know about it. So the pretty ominous headline here uh, in this finance Yahoo article, Germany is running out of workers. Some of you are going, Ken, why in the world are you telling us about Germany? Well, because what's happening in Germany now could very well happen in the United States next, and it's happening in other countries. How does it affect you? Stay tuned. Here we go. According to modeling by German government research institutes, Right now, they are now hitting a terrifying new prospect where the country's 47 million workers is going to stop growing. Some believe it already has. Okay, so what that means is, right now, Germany has 47 million of their citizens uh, and certainly uh, immigrants that are working. That's their worker base. Now, I want to give you some parallels as I walk you through this. Right now, they are saying that that's their max. They don't believe they got any more. Now, the United States is not in that situation, just to give you a a parallel. Right now in America, despite this weird economy we are in, we saw another healthy jobs report in May. So right now we sit at 10.1 million jobs that are open in this country. Open. Help wanted. And we have just a, just a hair over 8 million people that are unemployed. So we've still got this big gap between the amount of jobs we have available and the amount of workers who are saying, I'm looking. Okay. We have 7 million men that are working able that are staying home. Seven million men. They're just they're just not working. They're being supported by somebody. And then we also had four and a half million workers choose retirement during the pandemic. Okay? So we've got plenty of workers. But watch the trend that's happening here in Germany that could affect the United States. And then what does this mean for all of us? Without a major shift, Germany's labor force will shrink in the coming years because of the 47 million, they're expecting, obviously, a percentage every year, certainly in the boomer age, to drop out and retire. So it's going to start to shrink. So what happens? Well, this undermines economic growth. And here's how it does it. When, and Germany's going to then move into a situation that we have in the States, and some of you are wondering why inflation is still stubborn. Oh, that Joe Biden, or I eh, shouldn't have got rid of Trump, or rah, 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 COVID and the supply chain. The reason that inflation has spiked and has stayed around, folks, is what is called wage pressures. So watch what happens. I already gave you the stats for America. So in Germany, as they start to see that 47 million numbers shrink. It it affects economic development, which affects your pocketbook in that companies will need to be able to hire. They need to hire people. They're losing people. They got to hire people to keep going. When they don't have them to hire, guess what happens? They start recruiting people and they start a hiring frenzy like we saw for the last three years called the great resignation. And it's why The average teenager in America can make $14 an hour. It's why your loaf of bread costs more. It's why your combo meal costs more. It's why everything costs more because Americans are making more money now. Now, every time I mention this, I fail to mention this, so I'll just drop it out there for some of you that get really, really stemmed up when I explain basic basic economics. There are two things that companies can do when the cost of labor goes up. Most companies... And I'm not saying this is right or wrong. I'm saying this is what most companies do. But they have two options. One option is, which is what they do most, is they raise the price on the customer. If I got to pay this person $3 more an hour, I'm going to charge you on the combo or the milkshake or whatever. That's just what they do. Why? Because a lot of them are public companies. And they care about the stock price. And so when their expenses go up, it's a problem. 
Okay. Now, people hit me all the time on this. The other thing that they can do is they could choose to make less profit. I love the ones where people are like, those CEOs should make way less money. Sure. But again, you got boards, you got stockholders. It's not as simple as you think. But companies could, the second option, the companies could go, you know what? The nation is in a dangerous place of inflation. We are not going to pass along the cost to our customers. Now, can larger companies do that? Yes. But before you get all glee and go, oh, Ken has finally seen the light of day, let my old conservative who understands economics come out and say, well, that's great for Burger King. Yes, Burger King CEO paid himself $30 million last year. Could he make less? Yes. And how would that play into all this? Well, it's it, again, it's not so simple. But the small businessman or woman can't do that. The small business restaurant is their livelihood. Maybe it's been passed down three generations. When the cost of employ, employment goes up, they have to increase your costs. Do we want to put them out of business? It's not so simple. All right. So here's what happens. When we have less workers, it creates a frenzy where pay goes up because I got to pay more to attract someone to leave company A to come over to my company. And so this is why it can become very damaging from an economic development standpoint. So when you've got inflation going up and the economy slowing down, you can come into this, this, this uh, economic reality that most of you don't remember from fifth or sixth grade called stagflation. When the economy contracts, and so our gross domestic product, in other words, our profitability and productivity as a nation slips while costs go up, that sucks for everybody. That's when you see mass layoffs and you see longer unemployment times, and that's no good for anybody. So that's where Germany's at. They're on the, they're on the cusp of this. So they're actually anticipating that over the next decade, their labor supply will shrink by 3 million people. That's 7%. Unless, and these are retiring Germans, unless they are replaced by a significant influx of migrants. Those are people from other countries. So this is going to happen, by the way, in other countries. You might see it spread through Europe. And so now all of a sudden it changes everything on immigration. And immigration is a nuclear football politically in this country. But you've got realities here. I also think you're going to see Germany have to pivot and start seeing younger workers. We're starting to see this happen in the United States now where a lot of states are going at 14. You can now get a work license. Listen, I'm says I'm a guy that says if you're 12 and your mom and dad think you got the responsibility and you got a healthy work environment, let a 12-year-old can work. Go get you some, kid. We're not talking about child labor and slavery. We're not talking about that. We're talking about in the life of If your 12-year-old wants to work at your local grocery store and bag groceries, and they can bag them properly, and they're polite when they do it, come on. Now, if you soft parents would just sit back for a second and go, no, wait a second, it's probably better that he's bagging groceries and learning how to talk to adults and playing video games. Maybe you'd be okay with it. I don't know. Very interesting. So... Just to stay where they are, Germany's going to need 400,000 new workers. Where are they coming from? Well, I'm going to tell you what the bucket is. It's got to be coaxing retirees out of retirement and back in the workforce. But again, you have a limited scope of time, even if they do come back, just based on aging, health issues, and so forth and so on. And then the other issue is you got to get more teens, and you're going to have to get immigrants. You're going to have to open it up. And so what's going to be interesting about this is where does remote work come in? Where does AI come in? I think AI is going to replace a lot of those jobs, but it will spin off new jobs. So it's pretty fascinating. The crux of this article, the reason I share it for you, the people, why you need to be paying attention to this is because if this happens in the United States and we see this continue to be a problem where we have more jobs available than where people are, are, are actually willing to work, it is going to have devastating economic effects on us. And so you need to take care of your money. You need to be recession-proof. That's the takeaway here. Be recession-proof maybe by owning your own business, being tremendously valuable, and financially, you got peace. Did you know that recruiters take an average of six seconds to scan a resume? And that's if they ever see it in the first place. 
In fact, 75% of resumes are rejected before reaching a hiring manager. Listen, folks, if you want to get hired, you've got to make your resume worth noticing. That's why we created How to Write the Perfect Resume. This free guide will walk you through the five steps to stand out in the hiring process to get you your dream job. If you want to get started, go to kencoleman.com slash resume. All right, folks, uh, time to coach some people up here on the show. Don is waiting for us in Orlando, Florida. Don, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. How are you? I'm living the dream. What are you doing? Well, I was calling to see if I could get some career guidance from you. I've been a longtime listener, first-time caller. Oh, thank you. And, well, yeah, no problem. I really value you know, your advice, and you're someone um, who I greatly respect. So I was just curious what you would say about the situation that I'm in. All right, hit me with it. So I'm an emergency room physician, and right now things are very tough at the hospital where I work. Yeah. I thought once COVID-19 started to settle down that things would kind of go back to normal, but unfortunately we're now running into the problem of severe staffing shortages. We're short on nurses, ER techs, physician assistants, and ultimately it's just leading to all of us feeling overwhelmed and burned out, and we're all being stretched very thin, and it's to the point that I think we're all a little bit worried about a patient being harmed as a result of just not having the staff there. Yeah. Can I ask you a very quick question? And I want to make this about you. So just give me your best 20 second answer. I don't want to get lost in this. Why, why is this happening? I hear this reported, but you're a physician in an ER. Why are we having a hard time getting nurses and techs? What, why? What, what, what's causing this? They just said it's too much for us and we're out and there's not enough people to replace them? So I think it started during the COVID-19 pandemic. The situation was really challenging during that time because things were happening like we were on the cusp of running out of ventilators. We had patients who were lining up in the hallways. Right. We didn't have enough beds upstairs to admit patients to because they were all full. Right. And so I think everyone was just overwhelmed during that time. And we all kind of thought, like, once we get through COVID, it'll get better. And at that point, so many people had already left that it was just like a domino effect because as we became more and more short-staffed, more right. people continued so there's, to leave. So there's not enough people to replace the ones that said, I'm out. That's the problem. Correct. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Okay, keep going. So you're in a situation now where you are concerned about the health of your patients. And I'm, I'm equally concerned. It scares me to death because – when you're exhausted, when you are stressed, you're not at your best at giving medical care. It's not your fault. So, Correct. It's not uncommon for us to work 12-hour shifts and not even have a break to eat lunch. Right. Or so what's your question for me? So my question is, I could stay at this job, which pays very well because my employer recognizes right. the situation that we're working in. And so as a result, they're compensating us very well. They're one of the highest paying hospitals in the area. Uh, I could stay there, although I'm worried about you know my patients and I feel like we're not providing the level of care that they deserve mm-hmm. because of the staffing, or I could go to a lower paying job that is a better work environment, but it's probably going to be about a hundred dollars an hour pay cut. Wow. So I'm trying, I'm grappling with what to do. Okay. If, if you walked in today and said, I can't do this anymore and I am not going to be the cause of medical malpractice and a massive lawsuit, I just can't live with this. I'm sorry. I'm out how bad off would they be and and to what level would they be trying to convince you to stay? Um, I don't know from the physician standpoint, but I will say that some of the nurses have gone in and had that conversation with their supervisor. And they've said, you know, I'm concerned about my nursing license because I'm being asked to take care of 10 patients at a time. And my point is they'd freak out. They'd freak out. You know it. And I know it. Wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. The hospital administrator. Yes or no? Um, yeah, I boss. think they, they're, I think they're doing their best to try to retain the staff that they have. You right really now. do. You really believe they're doing everything they can. Yes. They just do not have anybody they can pull from. Correct. So the alternative to fix this is what? I mean, truly, what is the real fix? Before I give you my thoughts, because I, I, it really is based on this. There is no fix. They can't. Or, or they turn patients away. The only fix is that you just don't see as many patients. You just go, sorry, we can't take you. 
Is that right? Yeah. So typically what's considered safe for an ER provider to see patients per hour is about two patients maximum. And recently I've been doing around three is there, uh, for a 12 hour shift. Okay. So are they able to say, sorry, we can't take you. You're going to have to go to another ER. So what happens is that it just turns into a long wait time. So they can't actually turn anyone away due to uh, what's called the MTAL, MTAL laws. Right. Um, but the patients will just be in the waiting room for, you know, six to eight hours waiting to be seen. And it's just because we don't have the staff and often the beds to bring them back to a, you know, a room to see them. Um, so it, that's one of my concerns. All right. Is, so here's what we're going to do. Gonna, this deserves more time and I'm going to give it to you. I want you to hold on. I got to do a quick break, but I want you to hold on, Don, because um, I want to walk through this. I think it deserves more time. So hang on. I'll be right back. According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. If you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is the time to showcase how you are the best choice for the role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just some intentionality, you can prepare yourself to win the interview. Go to KenColeman.com slash interview. All right, we are talking with Dawn uh, from uh, the Orlando area. She is an ER physician and uh, ran out of time in the last segment, and I, and I really want to dive into this because I've actually never coached a physician who is in this situation, and it's very complex. And so, again, a quick recap before I bring her back on. Um, it's not gotten better. COVID was nuts. There were too many people, not enough machines and everything else, and you had an un bearable load for so many healthcare providers. We're talking about the doctors, the nurses, the techs, and so forth and so on. So a lot left. They said, I can't do it. I'm out. And the assumption was, is, well, we will get that help as things calm down. It hasn't happened. So Dawn is fried. Her team is fried. It's not healthy, but she makes really good money. And so she hits me, Ken, do I stay here and just put up with this? Or do I take a job where I'm making $100 an hour less? That's no easy decision in order to be in a healthy work environment. It's a legit, legit question. So Dawn, uh, as I was asking you, there really is no solution to this problem other than staff, if I understood you correctly, because while what's healthy is two patients an hour in an ER setting, you're having to deal with three, but you can't turn them away. All they do is they sit there and it means you've got longer hours. By this time, you're completely fried. And that's where the risk for you, the medical caregiver, is 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 coming to fruition, not being able to take care of somebody because you're not at your best. And have yeah. I understood that? So I've got that summed up well. Yes, correct. Okay. And then also, what from the nursing standpoint, I may order a medication. It may be an hour until somebody gets their antibiotic or their pain medication, just because we have two nurses that are trying to care for you know sometimes yeah. ten patients. So I feel like it really impacts patient care. And so there are not enough nurses in the pipeline that are getting educated and raising their hand and coming into the the system. Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. Or they come out and we've seen a lot of new nurses who have left within the first year because they, they just say it's too overwhelming and yeah. you know they decide that they don't want to do it anymore. All right. And the reason I'm diving into this so much is because I've never had the opportunity, as I said, to, to coach someone in your role. So this is a systemic problem, but it doesn't seem like there's two or three quick fixes uh, from a hospital administrator standpoint other than getting the labor in there, people in there. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct. Yes. Okay. So now that allows me to then shift to you. You can't stay in this ER environment much longer. At some point, it really begins to have massive effects on you if it's not already. And it also sets you up for malpractice or getting sued or all kinds of problems. Am I right? Yes. I've already noticed how much more anxiety I have. I mean, it'll yeah. start days before my stretch starts. I'll just have overwhelming yeah. Yeah. You know, anxiety and worry. Yeah. So 
So, but you're also dealing with, I'm guessing, I'm guessing here, I don't want to project this, crushing guilt when you think about walking out of this situation and it's who's going to replace you. Yeah, I know one of the things that they're looking at is hiring new grads out of residency, but that even worries me more because you're taking someone with no experience who's brand new and putting them into this environment. I just, I feel like we're kind of set up to to fail unless it's a near impossible situation. Okay. So it's not tenable even then if you had a couple of bright-eyed, bushy-tailed residents and you were uh, teaching them as you go, knowing that it would be painful and the same amount of work, even more so because you're having to instruct and guide, but for a season, then it could get better. You don't believe that's a possible solution? So the hospital where I work, we don't have uh, residents rotating through, so they would actually, uh, it's a, a single coverage here, so there's only one physician there. Yeah. So it would just be a single resident and no one else. They would graduate, yeah. so they would be a brand new attending, and it would just be them and no one else responsible for all the patients <sighs> and for leading the team. Oh, my gosh. All right, Don, so I'm guessing you, 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 you started off saying you respect me, listen to me, you want my opinion on what you should do. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm going to treat this uh, as if, you know, if, if this were my wife, Stacy, calling, you know, and dealing with this, because I'm not you, so I can't put myself fully in your shoes, but I'm trying to think, what would my advice be for my wife? And, and uh, my advice would be, you can't keep doing this and you can't feel guilty about this. And if we take a pay cut, um, it would be temporary, I think, because I think you would reset, get healthy uh, and find mm-hmm. other ways to. Um, supplement your income um, or put yourself in a different environment down the line, but you cannot continue to do this. It's not yeah, worth it. It's not your problem. And it sucks. And it's really scary when we talk about medical care, but um, I would tell you that you got to walk. Um, I wouldn't necessarily, and I'm not saying you've done this is your only option the one you presented to me where you're taking a hundred dollar an hour cut or are there other options? So my option would be one, I could go and do a telemedicine position, um, which pays roughly around $150 an hour, depending on which place you work for. I could also go do something like addiction medicine and be medical director for an addiction clinic, or I could just find a different emergency department um, to work in. And the ones that I've looked at are right around, you know, 175, 185 an hour, just because they're better staffed and they have easier time. And what are you, are those still a huge cut for you? Yeah, I'm at 250 an hour oh, right now. Okay, so so everything that you've looked at is still a sizable cut. I uh, yes, if, All right. unless I go to another ER that's also dealing with the under. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's not an option. We don't leave chaos to go to another chaotic environment. So the question becomes, it sucks just on paper, but the question is, are you in any kind of financial issues? Are you struggling with debt? Do you have a lot going on there, or do you have financial freedom where while it's a cut, the imp- the, the the improvement in your life, it doesn't matter. So at this point, we do have a paid off home, and right. we have we do have some some debt. I just got married recently, so we are um, paying off some remaining student loans. How much? Um, that uh, it's seventy one thousand dollars, but we actually have fifty five thousand dollars saved right now, so we should be debt free by like the end of July. Okay, so I would wait until I paid off the debt. If you can, okay. st- if you can stay with it, and I'll give you some advice there. What you're going to have to do is. You're going to have to have some boundaries. Okay. And and I don't know what's available to you, but I'm going to speak as a potential patient. Okay. If I'm sitting in the ER and I need real care and it's, and, 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 and I want a doctor who's at their best, I'd rather wait an hour for you to take a 20 minute nap. I don't know what that looks like, but if you're overwhelmed anyway, and people are waiting, excuse me, folks, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, uh, Don, I'm trying not to cough in the mic. All of a sudden, it's like I have a gremlin in my throat who's trying so hard to get me to just choke. But anyway, I guess my point is, what boundaries can you set in place? And if the patient's got to wait a little bit longer, but it allows you uh, to get a 10-minute break or a 20 minute break. I don't know if that's even silly as the way it sounds, but you're going to have to just whatever it takes to create some boundaries to get through until you get the debt paid off and we change our lifestyle or maybe get a full emergency fund plus the debt. And then we walk away. I think that's what I would do if I were you. 
Okay. Yeah, we do have a fully funded emergency fund at this point. Um, so we just have, have the debt to, to pay off. And like I said, we have about 55000 Well, you got right 55 now. of it. I don't know why you're waiting on it. I'd go ahead and pay the fifty five. Okay. And, and just watch how your budget changes. That's a lot. And mm-hmm. start, and then for a couple of months while we're waiting to pay off the rest of the money, I'd start working a budget. Of, this is what life's going to look like after I'm making $100 less an hour. So that's okay. a great ramp, and I love that. And so it's not going to be a huge shock to your system. And you've got to do this. you got to take care of yourself. you got to do it. Yep. you got to do it. Good heavens, folks. I appreciate your uh, patience with me here. I have no idea what's going on in my throat. But here's the takeaway. For anybody else that's in a situation like Dawn, when you are in such a vital role, we're talking about people coming in in ER emergency situations. One of the biggest challenges is when it's an unhealthy environment, but you feel that there's so much responsibility and weight on you, and if you walk away, you're dealing with some real guilt. That is real. That means you're a good person. But you've got to separate that. And you've got to say, look, I'm no good to anybody if I flame out. I can't give what I don't have. So that's the takeaway. Thank you for listening. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to the Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.